No, no problem. So, Abdel Rahman, thank you so much for joining me once again. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we had a great um, past two discussions um, on, on a number of different topics, and I'm glad that today we will be discussing uh, one particular text. Uh, we both agreed on Crisis of the Modern World by René Guénon. This is from the uh, School of Thought of Traditionalism, the idea that progress is something of a misnomer. Um, all of the things we think are new today, like scientific materialism, like technology, mechanization, democracy even, these things were known in the world of traditions, you know, the ancient world and even earlier than that. Um, but they were recognized at that time as being signs of decline. These are things which a society does when something has gone wrong um, at the deepest level, the spiritual level, when there's no longer really a, a possibility of properly interpreting um, what you see, you, you then have this misinterpretation which, um, which goes in these directions I just mentioned. So this is a way of thinking which um, really finds no representation within, within the system. Nobody in the media, nobody in politics, uh, nobody in the academic industry is going to um, espouse this way of thinking. So it's really exciting that you and I are going to be able to, to have this discussion that really nobody else will have. And I guess the first question I have for you is, um, in your, in your rereading of the text, what, what do you think, um, in, in retrospect, is the most important thing which we can learn from this book today? Well, I think uh, the book uh, reverts to uh, uh, traditionalism uh, in uh, a date which is all already a uh, hundred years old. So I think uh, there is a lot which has happened from this uh, time until now. In uh, its uh, period of a little under a hundred years. So uh, my out my outlook and perspective will be definitely uh, uh, influenced by uh, the contemporary situation and uh, the things which happened uh, in this period since the publishing of the book. Uh, and I think that the, the most important thing we can learn from uh, which is related to the idea of progress is that uh, the, the hierarchy which is uh, we can find in uh, traditionalism and uh, is itself uh, repeated uh, uh, in a different way. So if we look at traditionalism as uh, a hierarchy where there is a, a pyramid structure where uh, there is a, a king and priests and workers and uh, working class and so on and so forth uh, with the modern uh, uh, situation you find uh, a new way of uh, hierarch hierarchization if, if I may where uh, there is uh, there is also uh, the same uh, spiritual uh, uh, spiritual degrees and labels attached uh, uh, through artificial intelligence. So I think what we, we what we call in traditional society the the primitive uh, mind maybe or the the non uh, non the, the non rational not non rational mind. The, the, the spiritual or magical mind is repeated in a new way, uh, which is basically artificial intelligence and uh, automaton. So I think the, the aboriginal or the traditional subject is now reflected in contemporary society as the uh, automaton or the subject who, who has complete artificial intelligence. And I think the traditional values are uh, maintained uh, in, 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 in the same way. And I think also that uh, traditional values, even though uh, they are not apparently implemented by society, uh, by uh, uh, politics and society and stuff, but they are implemented maybe on a deeper, uh, deeper level uh, or a, 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 a way, a, an unmanifested level. If, we, if I can say this. So basically, uh, yeah, I think the idea of progress uh, is negated by this uh, conception of which I just demonstrated because uh, 
if you have the same traditional uh, model applied in a different way in the same uh, in in the in the in the technological and uh, post-humanist and artificial intelli intelligence era. Uh, so basically, there is no progress. It's the same thing under uh, different uh, guises or manifestation. Yeah. That's um, a very interesting and um, I'll admit kind of um, <laughs> um, uh, unexpected uh, interpretation um, of, yeah. of this text that uh, artificial intelligence is maybe um, reduplicating the, uh, the, the hierarchical social structure of the world of tradition, if I understand you correctly. So uh, the irony of, um, of democracy really is that rather than empower everybody to rule themselves, which Dana mentioned um, is metaphysically impossible, having somebody um, simultaneously rule and be ruled um, is uh, impossible for the same reason that some, you can't have potentiality and actuality at the same time in the same way is, is how he phrases it himself. Um, so we already know that democracy as advertised um, um, isn't really, you know, it, it, democracy is not what it is, is advertised to be. Um, the question is, I guess, simply who actually has this hierarchical um, position above the masses, and we usually think of it as being like, I don't know, CEOs and, and, and the super rich, but you're arguing it's actually just the machines yeah. themselves. You know, I, I, uh, I sometimes there's a, a, a lecturer and uh, he calls himself a uh, de occultist who called, he's called Mark Passio, and he's talking about the idea of. Uh, I don't, also I don't want to stray a lot uh, from the subject of the book, which is very interested by the, interesting by the way, but I just want to say this remark. He's talking about the, uh, the new epigenics uh, system, which is basically, he says, uh, uh, the idea is that the herd is calling itself. So it's a self-regulating uh, me mechanism where uh, because, you know, I think Corona is one of its manifestations. Uh, the society itself acts as its own, uh, what do you call it, as its own regulator. And you just have the system which initiates uh, this mechanism and it, it uh, continues, uh, it continues uh, by itself. But I think returning to the idea of progress, uh, I think this is not nothing new, really. This is something which has always happened, and uh, my, I wonder if it's really a natural thing. Because if the hierar the hierarchy the hierarchical model which is found in traditionalism is still continuing until uh, today uh, through other means, so perhaps it's a natural hierarchy. Because as you said, there is no controller. So maybe it's a natural, uh, it's, it's simply uh, something natural. So I wonder, I, I don't have an answer for this, but maybe you can shed some light. Yeah, that's uh, definitely an interesting way to, to think about the problem of hierarchy, which obviously still exists, no matter how democratic we claim society has become. The thing that comes to my mind um, when you talk about the kind of hierarchy in the world tradition, um, which really goes back to the, the, the monarchy, as you've mentioned, the idea of a king, one of the most unpopular uh, political um, uh, political structures today would be exactly that. If you actually read the philosophers from, say, the, the, the medieval era who provided a rational justification for monarchy, um, you will find that for them, monarchy is the only kind of um, polit political structure you can have uh, precisely if you have a species with reason. So Thomas Aquinas and Ibn Khaldun both basically yeah. made parallel arguments about why, no, it's not irrational to have one man rule over like a kingdom. That's precisely what you have to do 
if you have um, humans as not just being animals, like all of the, the lower ones, but, but um, animals with, with logos. Um, it's precisely because we have rationality that we have to do this. And the argument, um, to give you a kind of a short form, uh, version of it, is that with wild animals, meeting their basic um, survival needs um, can be accomplished with just the body parts which nature gave them. So uh, if you have claws, if you have teeth, if you have wings, etc., and you're a wild animal, you can pretty much meet all of your survival needs just with those things. The irony is when you become a human, you lose those sort of um, body parts which would be sufficient. We don't have the claws, the, the sharp teeth, uh, the wings, etc. Um, instead, we have uh, very intelligent minds and we have language. And it's precisely because we have the ability for things like language and therefore proper political structure um, that uh, we have to have um, some organization um, in order to meet our needs because now the minimal unit of survival is a whole community rather than just like you know one if it's like a, a solitary wild animal that can basically just live in the wild and meet all of its needs um, you kind of lose that with with humans and instead you have to have yeah. community and the great example of even if you have a farmer who's growing all his own food, where did he get the tools? He got them from a blacksmith. Well, where did the blacksmith get the strength to forge the tools except from the food which the farmer grew? They, even if you're trying to do a bare minimum with just focusing on the guy growing the food, even he needs help from somebody else within the, the local economy. And because you have to have community, um, you have to have order. And they argued that the only order which will really be good enough to keep this whole operation um, functional is the order which a king provides. And it's funny that you would say we yeah. basically have that orderer now. It's just it's not even any one person. It's just the um, the artificial intelligence, the electronic brains themselves. Um, Julian Assange, uh, before he was arrested, gave a very yeah. sort of a scary speech about how you know the AI. Um, um, running in the background of, of uh, Google, for I think was his own example, um, is advancing to the point that um, even the option of being transparent to um, human intelligence is kind of vanishing. And he said this years ago. Um, and he was saying that, you know, this is occurring at a level which is literally becoming imperceptible to, to a human mind. And it's, it's an orderer, which no doubt keeps the whole world functioning if you were if you remove google uh, tomorrow um and, and everything else with it you will yeah. see the structure which we take for granted catastrophe catastrophe yeah uh, telling, telling uh, catastrophe right i mean we had fantasies about this uh almost exactly 20 years ago with uh, the y2k fantasy i don't know how big that was in egypt but in america yeah. like even my father like stocked up on like all kinds of you know like many sacks of like you know rice and and all kinds of because people said you know if the computers can't up um can't uh move uh to the next uh millennium um to the year 2000 um you know everything's gonna shut down that was 20 years ago i mean uh the level of technological um interconnectedness um and dependency today is far beyond what we saw in like 1999 so in a certain sense, I can agree with you that, you know, uh, the AI is kind of providing this order um, in a properly non-democratic way, by the way. Um, the idea that the Democrat ma democratic masses have power just by voting, it's, a, it's an absolute joke. The orderer is simply that. Um, yeah. but, but the irony is that the requirements for that are precisely for humans to lose their rationality Whereas for Ibn Khaldun and Aquinas, I, I would argue that it was it was it was compatible with human rationality. But now the requirement is for us to no longer be rational, to no longer think in any meaningful level. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, I think rationality uh, takes us to another uh, place in the book, uh, which is how will you employ this rationality? I think there is a very, a very uh, important theme which Genoa repeats over and over again, which is the, the dialectic between the East and West. 
and this is something that I've been thinking about for a lot of time. So, so you know, basically, the East and West, they, they are different uh, positions or stances uh, towards truth, where the East think, uh, thinks uh, the, the East is completely anti-practical. Uh, the East thinks the truth is uh, observation, uh, contemplation, and living. And you know, uh, the, 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 the theme of the pure philosopher who does nothing all day, uh, you know, sit on the couch or just, uh, you know, uh, do nothing, uh, become lazy and uh, just live. And uh, on, the, on the other hand, the West is uh, the, 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 the manifestation of work and action and uh, practicality, pragmatism. So uh, what, what, what manifestation of reason is the most uh, uh, important? Or, or, the, or, 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 or which one, which one uh, is, is right? So I think uh, uh, there is also uh, a, a way to combine the East and West, and this uh, is kind of uh, ties in with my own studies uh, 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 on the holistic period, and it's also a religious theme, where uh, you know uh, Alexander the Great was one of the few leaders on, on uh, in history who tried to combine both east and west so he wanted to get, uh, get uh, he wanted to get the spirituality and uh, the philosoph philosophizing of the east uh, combined with the action of the west so yeah so so there is uh, the, the the dialogue between the east and west is also manifested historically in uh, the character of alexander the great who uh, wanted to com to combine the st spirituality and the uh, philosophy of the East uh, and the religion of the East with the practicality and pragmatism of the West. And, uh, you know, uh, I think there is a meeting point there, and this is, uh, I think in chapter three, uh, Guinon talks about this, but it's uh, a prevalent theme to, uh, throughout the book. So uh, I think uh, this, uh, is this ties in with the, uh, the question of rationality so uh, the the question is how how should we uh, what what is actually acting rationally because uh, maybe uh, just living and contemplating and living the simple life without uh, much thinking much stress maybe this is the rational choice uh, if you're talking from from an eastern perspective because, uh, but on the other hand, maybe uh, success and pragmatism and doing uh, work and, uh, you know, achieving a position in life and so on and so forth. Maybe this is uh, the, the rational point, uh, the rational thing to do. So uh, I think the question of East and West is uh, very related to uh, rationality. And I'd like to hear your take on this also because it's part of the book. Yeah, that's a, a great question. I feel that since I've lived in both uh, the East and the West, uh, so I'm yeah. from the United States, but I've lived in India for several years, um, really lived in India off and on for about three years at this point. And I think that um, the idea that the West is practical while um, the East is you know, more uh, absorbed in uh, theoretical contemplation. There certainly is a uh, validity to that um, way of phrasing it. But the most surprising thing I think is that the West, which claims to be so practical, actually has reached the point now where people as individuals, I'm talking, um, really don't do that much. So the funny thing about it is, um, the big practical accomplishments in the United States are being done by machines. I mean, it, it's, it's a situation in which the economic activity there really is just totally um, automated away. And people's role in the United States is really to just be passive consumers. And you find this in the university, yeah. for example. Um, in um, India, for example, where I am, you hear people talk a lot about their education. Okay? You're, if someone's in college, for example, you hear them talking about their education because um, they, they go to the college um, 
uh, to, to learn. I mean, there's no football stadium. There's no uh, really recreational stuff on the college campus. Yeah. If you go to a college campus um, in India, um, it's pretty much, it looks almost like a high school. It's just classrooms. Okay. So you, you haven't, you're educated, but in America. Function, functional. Right. So it's, 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 it's no, no unnecessary bullshit for lack of a better word. Um, it's just the, the stuff that's actually relevant to, to learning. Um, but you go to a college campus in America, the, the classrooms are the least interesting part of the campus. I mean, they know that having yeah. all of these other ridiculous sort of construction projects to just sell people on the entertainment value of being there. So the thing is, you hear about um, ex you hear about education in India, but in, in the United States, you hear about experiences <laughs> because what they're really selling yeah, to the administrators yeah, yeah. they talk about is like, well, no, it's the college experience, which is so, which is and, what and connections doing. and connections too, and, and uh, especially in Ivy Leagues and stuff, connections. Right. So um, the idea is that uh, going to, uh, you know, Yale, Harvard, um, you're not going there to learn about whatever you could get the same education. You could you could read the same textbook at any campus. Right. Um, what you're paying all that extra money for is, like you said, the, the networking, um, which is really just a euphemism for saying that they rent out rich access to rich people. Um, that's what it is. They're selling tickets of admission to be in the physical proximity of wealthy people. I'm talking uh, like somebody whose father is the president of another nation as uh, you know, my sister went to Yale and, and she described some of her classmates um, as, as being that sort of, that's the kind of people which the university knows they're selling you the um, uh, basically just the physical space that they're inhabiting, you're buying a ticket to be in that space, okay? Um, but even at a, a lower college where you're not paying for that per se, like a low rank state school in the United States, you're paying for still an experience. It's just the basest consumption of, of partying and that sort of entertainment. And the irony is that um, the, the West is precisely where even your education is not really practical in the sense of you having to do anything. Um, and whereas in India, I feel that not only in education, but really in all sectors, you, you find people doing a lot more. Even cooking is a great example. In India, we, uh, me and my wife yeah. could, could spend just a couple dollars um, on groceries for a week. We're in the rural village yeah. because we buy vegetables from local farms and we make um, uh, food uh, from, from raw ingredients. But in America, you don't buy vegetables. You buy canned goods and you buy, you know, bottles of artificial pre-made stuff with all kinds of preservatives. And, you know, it's not even really what it's a simulation. It's like fast food is, is spread this to the whole world. It's a simulation which looks like food, but it's actually just a bundle of super cheap um, artificial, you know, uh, materials that are have been engineered to taste like some other food they're mimicking. So the funny thing is, um, the practical, the practicality of the West is actually at this point being done by machines and the people um, really don't even have the skills to cook their own food. And it's a, it's a very strange um, and, and sort of counterintuitive um, uh, result of allowing this sort of decline to happen is by emphasizing practicality at, at the expense of theory, you actually lose the ability both to think theoretically and to do anything practically. I, I think, I think to, to some degree, uh, this is true, yeah, because... Uh, there, there is, there is, there is a new uh, emerging uh, lifestyle which is uh, neither eastern nor western, but uh, maybe, maybe this uh, uh, because we have four directions, you know. So maybe we are talking about just, uh, just as we are talking about east and west, we can talk about also north and south, and but I think uh, there, there are. The, the, the current uh, situation affords many variations. So, you know, uh, at the same time, uh, as people, many people who, you know, eat canned food and uh, stuff like this, I see also, and I'm personally trying to follow this, a rise in, uh, you know, uh, 
the theory of nutrition and the diets and and the, you know uh, healthy choices and I'm I personally am trying to follow this for many years. so so if you're talking about healthy food for example you are integrating uh, uh, you are integrating thinking with the, with action because you, the action you do is go, when you go to buy to from the store stuff you are also making conscious choices on every uh, food and then you are cooking it in a certain way and so you're employing thinking so i think there are many choices there are many uh, uh, there are many uh, uh, there are many uh, ways to think it's not only one thing and i think this is also the result of East coming with West, because of course the internet and technology allowed allowed us to come uh, nearer, and this is actually what happens in uh, what happened in Alexandria du during the cosmopolitan era, where uh, you know uh, many people from many parts of the world came together, and uh, from here came the interaction between East and West, and and came the interaction between uh, practical and wor working. Uh, and uh, pragmatism and uh, theory and philosophy. So I think it's a useful interaction, but uh, also it contains some harms because uh, sometimes there is a lot of conflicts and clashes. And sometimes there is, as you said, uh, people who take uh, things for granted and neither work nor, uh, nor think because they think everything is uh, provided for without any... Uh, without any need for uh, uh, trying to do anything and they are uh, uh, they can fall into the trap of complete passi passivity and uh, and this is also a, a danger uh, which is I, I i agree with you it's something that's growing in number uh, but on the other on the other hand if we are still uh, observing the hierarchies these uh, categories who take everything for granted without working will fall into the lower hierarchies, which is we may consider uh, uh, cattle-like or something like this. So I think, uh, uh, the, yeah, the, uh, uh, but but also there is another theme of, in the book. I think we have we haven't discussed yet, which is uh, the cycle of the ages. Uh, I think this return to traditional hierarchies. Uh, uh, this return to traditional hierarchy through uh, artificial intelligence and uh, technological means means that we are uh, entering a new cycle in the, the cycle of the ages which is called uh, I think Kali Yuga or something like this so uh, overall uh, the spirit or zeitgeist of the age I think we are going to into a uh, Okay, we are we are in at the worst. We are at the the, the, the lowest level, but I think this indicates uh, a, a new gold, something like a new golden age, which we should be able to see in our lifetime, if not in a couple of years, but maybe when we are a bit older. So I'm optimistic in this department, uh, and I think uh, this cycle is uh, something. Uh, not only Gano talks about, but uh, you can find it in uh, in uh, Hesiod, and uh, and I think you talked about it also in your uh, in your video, and you, you you expanded about it. So I'd like to take I would like to think uh, to see what uh, you th that if, how you, th you see the reflection of the cycle of ages on our times, and uh, how how do you think the future in the cycle of ages is like? Yeah, that's uh, definitely an important part of the book is uh, the argument yeah. that uh, Kali Yuga, I, I don't think so much that it's beginning. I think it's uh, sort of uh, been going on uh, for some time now. Um, the, the Dark yeah. Age, the, the final age of this cycle, which yeah. in itself is largely, um, I think uh, it's, uh, it's well represented by the image from the book of Daniel in the Old Testament of a statue yeah. which appeared in a dream which had a, a golden head and I guess his chest was silver and then you move on 
finally you get to the feet and that's where you're in the iron age. And it's not so much, I think that it is, um, four different, uh, positive, um, substances in themselves. It's rather, I think that the iron age is negative. It's a negative phenomenon defined by losing access to the kind of insights you had on a hermeneutical level in the golden age. And that's, I think, um, the the most important thing to keep in mind when evaluating the the kind of world we're living in today is it's a it's largely a negative phenomenon i mean the 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 need for mechanization happens as i always say when you can't do spiritual hermeneutics anymore um democracy is what happens when you can't see the legitimacy of older and more traditional types of political organization. Even referencing um, monarchy today is probably enough to get, you'll probably be shouted down in public if you talk about a king. That's the most unpopular um, type of political organization. And yet you will find in the medieval era that it, it just made sense on even on rational grounds to the greatest philosophers of the Middle Ages. And the inability for us today to see what they saw in, in, in the Middle Ages and the ancient world, and even earlier than that, I think is, um, is, is more um, indicative of an absence of something than of a presence. So I definitely agree that this, this is the Kali Yuga. I mean, you just look around and, and you will it'd be hard for us to call this anything except a dark age. Um, the question is how far along are we and what happens? Julius Evola claimed that there's uh, maybe an ancient Hindu text or something which claims that there will be some sort of a catastrophic battle um, that, uh, that ends. Yeah. yeah. Actually, actually, the battle, I think, the battle is recurring in all uh, religious texts. And uh, you find it in the Hindu, I think, uh, in the Rig Veda. And I think, uh, of course, uh, the, the Armageddon in Christianity and the Battle of the End of Times, uh, the rise of Mahdi in Islam. Uh, it's, uh, this battle, I think, it's uh, prevalent in all uh, religions and uh, uh, and uh, and all uh, spiritual doctrines, and I think, uh, yeah, this this marks the end of the cycle and the beginning of the new cycle. So, uh, yeah. yeah, the question I think is uh, who's going to be fighting exactly? Uh, Evola mentioned some reference, if I recall him correctly, of uh, almost like uh, some of the gods being involved in this battle. I mean, it's not merely a, a struggle of humans. I mean, it's almost like a supernatural battle, right? Yeah, I think uh, uh, this uh, supernatural. I'm kind of studying the Iliad these days, so you know the powers of nature's, uh, like Zeus, for example, has this. Uh, uh, the the Olympian gods in Greek uh, mythology are interfering with the battles of uh, the the Greeks who who are separated into Achaeans and. Uh, other and Trojans and uh, fighting out together. So I think uh, uh, battle is uh, something which is uh, so uh, fundamental, especially on earthly human life. And uh, uh, of course, it's not surprising that uh, the earliest texts, the earliest texts uh, are uh, talking about battle he battles heavily. So I think it's something that spans across all traditions. And of course, yeah, battles are uh, kind of, uh, are directly related to gods because uh, I think gods in the ancient conceptions uh, are like, uh, they are like lofty beings who uh, treat humans as the them play, fight it out together, and uh, seeing the outcome and results. So, yeah, yeah, yeah I think battles, uh, uh, battles uh, of this scale, of this uh, end time scale. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, the irony uh, is today, um, even with no shortage of war 
we've actually lost um, the the concept of this sort of battle uh, because you know Evola talks about the the uh, the kind of um, heroic um, action in battle, which was valued in the world of tradition, which even survives in the Middle Ages in Christianity in the form of the Crusades. There's really nothing Christian about the, the kinds of things valued in the Crusades, in which that's a time when you actually find something like um, uh, heroic action in battle being above um, uh, spirit, uh, uh, above like uh, um, the kind of contemplation which a monk would do in a monastery. That's not really a Christian idea. That's a an idea of tradition, which you know survives into the Middle Ages. Um, but uh, that kind of battle has disappeared, precisely because uh, war today has become a mechanized phenomenon in which Evola says you can only have this concept in say World War One of uh, just. Uh, humans being mowed down by machine guns, and then of course you have like the uh, the, the sort of uh, what was it biological weapons that or or uh, you know uh, yeah. chemical weapons I want I should say that were uh, that were yeah that were abused in World War One. I. I mean th at that point you you have you have death you have violence but you don't have war anymore because you've lost the proper spiritual but, form. But mm -hmm. it's 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 still it's still a kind of war. I think biological and chemical. And even what I will call play wars, it's really uh, an effective, not an effective, but it's a kind of war. But I think it's uh, much more dangerous because uh, uh, things are not as clear as they used to be. Because in the past, you know, battles were clear; there were uh, defined uh, limits and defined uh, sides. But I think battles and wars in our times. And uh, in the era where uh, chemical and biological weapons are used, they're uh, uh, unclear and uh, plague-like. So uh, I think they affect everyone equally. So right, and Gina has mentioned that the 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 real meaning of democracy is that now everybody is equally eligible to die. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's that's a good thing. Yeah. That's a good thing to uh, write. It's right. I think it's right. Yeah, yeah unfortunately, yeah, it's, a, it's an accurate description of, of the situation. But uh, I think that the, the, the uh, battle, the apocalyptic battle, which ends this, it's certainly going to be more like the, the battles described in the ancient world. It's going to be one of those rather than the sort of um, perversion of, of warfare itself, which we see today. Yeah, I think uh, I think uh, apocalyptic is uh, one of the best uh, uh, the best words that can describe our times. And uh, but uh, actually, uh, the theory of uh, the theories of apocalypse uh, are kind they kind of never stopped throughout history. So it's kind of always been an apocalypse somehow. And uh, it's kind of always been disaster in every age. So I think uh, the true way to escape from apocalypse, uh, even though battle is inescapable, but I think the, the, the real way to escape from it is to go inward subjectively. And I don't know, maybe I'm affected by my study of Plotinus and uh, Neoplatonism and, and, and these theories, but uh, I think, uh, yeah, because it's, I think it will always be chaotic, especially in the, the times we're living in. It will not get better, it will get more chaotic, but the idea is we have to uh, begin building our, our uh, selves, inner subjective, and this is the way uh, to avoid the, the calamities of the Iron Age. That, like Hesiod said in his works and days, he said he, he escaped the, the, the evils of his age by uh, getting absorbed in work. And uh, yeah, I think this is basically the, the main methods to uh, end the apocalypse. And maybe we, when, when we are working on ourselves and doing our work correctly uh, step by step we will finally achieve 
uh, either we are, will be good good in battling from our knowledge because it's like basically an enforce or we will be uh, uh, we reach a good state of mind inwardly and this would be enough and it's interesting um, you mention um, the maybe alternative interpretation of apocalypse, the maybe less literal interpretation, because um, from the start, um, apocalypse was actually a concept which came from astrology. According to um, John Michael Greer, um, the, the idea of apocalypse sort of um, begins historically with Zarathustra, the um, great uh, Iranian, the great Persian um, astrologer, who, as the Magic. story, hmm? uh, I'm sorry. I was saying one or the magician. Right, the uh, the the magi, I guess they would say in, in the ancient world. Um, so. Zarathustra, um, as the story goes, um, sorry about that. Um, so Zarathustra, the, the story goes, um, was an astrologer who noticed something in the stars that indicated that the old paradigm, the old order, and he was talking about the order in the stars, by the way, the old order in the stars was about to give way to a new order. And the transition from one ordering to another was the apocalypse. Okay, and he he didn't, as the story goes, interpret yeah. this only um, figuratively because John Michael Greer um, speculates that he himself not only fought in a holy war over this an apocalyptic battle, if you will, uh, but uh, he says by some accounts, um, Zarathustra might have even been one of the first martyrs of the apocalyptic holy war. So it's interesting uh, to, to think of it as, as, as an, uh, a concept of astrology. And I guess my question for you, as somebody who's uh, much more knowledgeable about, about this than I is, uh, what do you make of, of this idea? Well, the, the idea of uh, the, the, the collapse of uh, one uh, worldview and the, 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 the rising of another, I think this, uh, this is, uh, we can find this in, you know, every, uh, every modern uh, anti-traditional religions. So uh, Buddhism actually was against Hinduism and Buddha was like uh, 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 against, he, he, his teaching was uh, an antagonistic to the older Hindu gods. And this is also a tradition from the old perspective to the new perspective. You see the same in uh, uh, Judeo-Christian uh, religions, where Abraham, uh, the, the father of the Jude Jude Judaism and the Judeo-Christian uh, religions, uh, he was against the, you know, the, the, the idols, which is the best representation of the old uh, view, uh, which, which has been functioned. And he breaks them down, you know, and uh, comes with the new uh, uh, religion of uh, Abrahamism or uh, Judaism. So I think, yeah, I, this is very true. What the what the Dar Sutra did is reflected in the the universal tendency at the time, which I think uh, maybe is around 1000 BC, maybe. Uh, or something like this, where the, there was a, a great change overall in uh, a universal change, which refused the old and uh, wanted to uh, move in a new direction. So the fact that it's a, 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 an interpretation of astrology, um, does that play any role in maybe uh, there being something other than maybe a literal interpretation. I know that uh, in alchemy, for example, the trap which Gainau, um himself emphasized is, well, you know, it, it, the problem with modern people interpreting alchemy is uh, they, they, they take a too literal stance. And, um, you know, this is something which I have mentioned myself, you know, years ago, I said, oh, that's uh, turning uh, lead into gold, but that's precisely the, 
the, the, the interpretation you're not supposed to limit yourself to. It's a gateway to something else. So, mm-hmm. I mean, is, is astrology, so he's interpreting something in astrology. Does, that, does it have also that kind of emphasis on not so literal interpretation? Yeah, I think I think astrology uh, because uh, I I remember uh, the verse where Abraham uh, the verse says literally so he looked uh, to the stars and said I am sick and I think this is from the Quran and I think also in uh, the Bible uh, there is a verse which I'm not I don't know the literal uh, what it says literally but I know that it says. Uh, the Abraham was uh, worried that his uh, he will have no offspring, and God tells him he will have uh, as many children as there are stars in the sky. So I think uh, bringing up astrology in this transition from traditional to uh, new is very relevant. I think you're very you you, you brought it. Uh, uh, it's very relevant, and uh, it's also maybe yeah. Of course, astrology is not uh, as literal as in the materialistic sense which, which we're thinking of. And uh, we can see also uh, another modern representation of the same thing we're talking about in the series of Star Wars, maybe. So Star Wars, you think, is to be interpreted um, as itself a, a meditation on astrology? On the, Because... Uh, you see, you see, ap- apocalypse is uh, a kind of war, and uh, as we said, it's related to ast- astrology. So maybe uh, Star Wars is this uh, is uh, has symbolic manifestation of this kind of wars, uh, of this kind of astrological wars, uh, and uh, which which is. Uh, which refers to this change which happened, which happened from the, or this transi- transition which happened from the uh, traditionalism to the new uh, perspective. Yeah, I think of uh, Zizek's interpretation of Star Wars in his book, uh, Parallax View, where he said, if you really think about it, um, the Star Wars universe is the pagan universe. And I remember there was a documentary um, on television back in the 90s about, uh, well, you know, uh, between Star Wars and Star Trek, obviously Star Trek is more realistic because Star Wars, they're talking about the Force, whereas in Star Trek, they're just talking about technology. Um, so it really is a Star Wars. It's it's um, kind of a it, there's this illusion uh, because there's so much advanced technology in it that it's um, kind of maybe a, a modern or anti-traditional story. But it actually is. I agree with you. Kind of a traditional story in which it's a pagan universe. You have the Force. You have um, the, uh, the the monarchy, right? You have Princess Leia and and the sort of royalty and the Republic. Yeah. Right, so it's a it's a complicated political thing. You you have the empire, obviously, uh, um, and and um, the the uh, rebels against it. Um, so it's a very complicated uh, situation politically, but it is still not exactly a modern story. And Zizek says um, in the New Age pagan universe, which Star Wars actually is, the birth of Anakin Skywalker is basically the birth of Jesus Christ which is, you know, the, the most scandalous yeah. thing which can happen there. And he said, you know, this isn't just maybe Zizek's own interpretation. Eh? There's something within the uh, the story itself about how uh, Anakin Skywalker was uh, born of a virgin or that yeah. he didn't have a, he doesn't have a father or something like that, right? And then he has, uh, he has something special about him since he was uh, very young. You know, I'm talking to, uh, uh, he was raised by, uh, you know, uh, in, a, in a tough situation, just like Jesus, I think. So there are many parallels, you know, yes, I think. Right, and then he, uh, I guess he comes out of slavery, kind of like Moses. I don't know, there's all kinds of strange parallels you could find. But uh, I guess the, uh, the, the shift of paradigm, which you've mentioned, um, in um, uh, in uh, Zarathustra's interpretation of astrology, the paradigm shift probably is the birth of Anakin Skywalker, right? 
Yeah, I think you can you can think of it of it this way. You you can think of uh, this shift as uh, abandoning the old uh, and uh, entering the new. So yeah, it's like a birth. <laughs> I think this is uh, a good re realization. Yes. It's uh, it's it's interesting because like like I said, it seems like a modern show. Just be, but the technologies are kind of they're they're kind of present on an ad hoc basis. I don't think the lightsabers um, really uh, are necessary except to uh, meet the expectations of the viewers. I mean, really, they're basically just swords. That's the irony of it: is you have all of this technological development and you're still fighting with swords because that's yeah, the yeah. motif of tradition, right? I think uh, Einstein said like uh, something about uh, re relevant to this that uh, he knows that uh, the Thir World War Three would be fight would be fought by uh, uh, atomic bombs and nuclear bombs and stuff like this, but World War Four would be would be fought by sticks and stones. So there is uh, also the the idea of reverting back to the very not just traditional but maybe even prehistoric. Uh, methods of uh, fighting and uh, you know so yeah yeah there's a uh, saying from saudi arabia which is uh you know my father rode a camel i drive a mercedes benz my son has a private yeah. jet and his son will ride a camel yeah it's a cycle yeah mm -hmm. So that's a lot of great uh, things we discussed. Uh, it's uh, nearly five o'clock here. So mm -hmm. I, I guess to finish out the conversation, I, I would just ask um, if there's anything else you'd like to mention about the book, anything more you'd like to discuss. So, yeah, basically I think uh, we have, uh, towards the end of the discussion, we have, uh, brought, uh, we have brought up a very interesting idea for me and probably you know about this, uh, you know more about this uh, than me, which is the relationship between the astrological cycles and uh, the, the, the idea of traditionalism and modernity. So, uh, yeah, I think this is a very interesting idea and uh, I think I will reflect more upon it and maybe you can do another uh, talk about it if you're, uh, if you're willing. Yeah, that would be awesome, and we can uh, kind of uh, think about some more of these things. Uh, there's certainly a lot more there. Maybe uh, we can think about some more, like, maybe sci-fi films or whatever. I think there's a lot there. There's a lot more there that could yeah. be explored. Exactly, exactly. And, uh, yeah, I'm interested in movies a lot because, uh, you know, one of my favorites uh, when I was starting out in philosophy in general was Zizek. I used to watch him for hours and he is a big film critic so yeah i think there is a lot of in, in movies especially sci-fi movies so, yeah, yeah it was it was interesting i just i'm, I'm finishing up writing um a, a book which is over 500 pages um specifically against technology i've been wanting to write this book for a long time it's specifically my sort of long critique of technology and the irony about the book was i had to like write about a bunch of films in order um, to talk about why technology sucks <laughs> so it's, it's ironic but it works and, uh, and you, you wrote it you wrote it probably on a computer right well you know it would it would be difficult to submit it to uh, amazon kdp if it was just written on a typewriter with manuscript and in paper form yeah yeah <laughs> exactly so yeah yeah, yeah, great Sorry. talk today. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks once again. And uh, I look forward, we'll be, uh, we'll be in contact and we'll uh, have another, another discussion. Yeah, specifically on, uh, on uh, trying to, we'll, we'll maybe talk about some films um, we could both try to watch uh, uh, and, uh, and discuss. Okay, that, that would be great. That would be great. And thank you for having me. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for, for, for uh, appearing on the show. I appreciate it. And, uh, and take care. Take care, you too. Thanks. Okay.